I want to encourage you now to remember that prayer list back there on the table and if you go out this morning well, I take a moment and pick a time, half hour time and uh, lift the campaign up in prayer. So, uh, Clayton, you got anything you want to say? All right, thank you, Clayton. All right. The songwriter said, This is my father's world, and to my listening ears all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wondrous wrought. <clears throat> the other night I was <clears throat> sort of surfing through uh, channels on television. I came across uh, a science ch channel and we were watching uh, new things that scientists had discovered in the last 20 years about our universe. Uh, they uh, discovered uh, these new things uh, not because uh, they, not because they, they knew them already, of course, but because they had new equipment that could look at a situation and diagnose it for what it was and send back evidence of what was there and what wasn't and so on. But the one thing it doesn't do, it, it, they, they said it never goes beyond in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we've been talking to you about uh, what kind of a God he is. Who is God? Uh, what is God doing? Uh, and what does God know, and, and who does he have favorites, or is he at work in the lives of all people? Well, we know that God uh, really doesn't have any favorites as such, but that God is at work in his universe. He created it and put man and woman in it, and to be soulmates and to be party with him to develop his creation. He put all kind of animals in it and, and said that man would be in control of all the animals that were there. And then we know that God uh, is not only concerned about his creation as such and man and woman certainly so, but he is concerned about uh, their sin. Uh, we have to realize that uh, sin is not always, it doesn't always consist of the things we do or don't do. But sin consists of who we are. Uh, at the seat of my affections and at the seat of your affections, wherever that might be, there is where sin lies dormant and at certain intervals rises up in your life and mine and if we're not careful, can destroy us. That's the sin that God came to deal with in your life and in mine today. He came to deal with all of us who have bad hearts, so to speak. He came to deal with all of us who have bad natures in order that we might be redeemed. And now he knows us for what we are. 
Uh, there isn't any hiding from God uh, for any of us. He knows us in the most intimate way. He knows the inter-recesses of our hearts and our lives. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we have thought. And he knows when we have bad thoughts. We don't always have to get them into action. Even before they ever, we ever act upon them, he knows they're there and warns us that we better watch out. And so we serve a loving God who cares for us and wants us to be redeemed. Now, he tried every way possible to do that. He tried the commandments. He tried the prophets. He tried the judges. He tried every way he could think of in order to redeem us. And they all failed. Because the scripture says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And we have not been able to do that, never been able to do that. It's an impossibility for any of us to do that on our own. But we can do it. When God comes into our lives, he enables us. God in Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. I don't care how hard you try to be a righteous person, it's impossible. You cannot do it. And so he came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ in the manger at Bethlehem and came in the person of his son and lived for 30-some years and went to a cross, and there he died, crucified, for you and me. And later on, three days later, rose from the dead, and he declares himself to be alive forevermore. And so for every generation, Christ did for them what they could not do for themselves. He took upon himself their sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It isn't any wonder that Paul would shout as loud as he could, Be ye reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You who are estranged because of your sin, come back to the Father and enjoy his presence. And so in Christ Jesus, he made it all possible. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about God. We've talked about him being incarnated in Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to spend a little bit talking with you about the third person of the Trinity. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus said, <clears throat> it's important for you said to the disciples, it's important for you that I go away. If I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will come to redeem you and to be in you, to enable you to be his people. Now, I look around here this morning, I, I don't see the Holy Spirit here, but I know he's here. The wind blows where it wills, you can't uh, tell where it comes from and where it's going, but we know we can see the effects of the wind. So it is with the Holy Spirit. You cannot see him. You can feel him. You can see him working in the lives of others, and you can see him working in your own life. But as a figure, we cannot see him. One child came home from church one day and said, Mommy, I don't want to go back to church. And she said, Well, why not? I and the little girl said, Well, Mommy, they said the church was filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm scared. Well, it, 
the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. And we have no right to be scared of Him. He came to be with us. He first of all came to convert us, to make us after His own way and His own will. Nicodemus didn't understand that. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how can I be born again? And Jesus said, you must be born again by the Holy Spirit. They are born of the Spirit of God. I, <clears throat> I know as much today about my conversion all right, I'll put it another way. I don't know any more about my conversion today than I did when it happened six years ago. You know. Have I studied about it? Yes, I've thought about it, studied about it, but I'm, I, I'm no closer than understanding what took place in my life then than I am now or now than I am that it was then. Why? Because it's impossible for us to understand the work of the Holy Spirit in His fullness. How God in, in spirit could take us and redeem us and make us into new people. I do not understand that. But we can all enjoy that. We don't have to understand it, you see. Once you give yourself to Christ and that happens and you're a new person, you begin to live for Him. And so the Holy Spirit came to us when Christ left. God, the third person of the Trinity, came to us so that God could continually be in us and with us as we lived and served in the world today. That's the joy of the Christian faith. As long as you live, you will never be alone. I'm going to say that again. As long as you live, you will never be alone. God the Holy Spirit will always be there. He came as a counselor. He came as a comforter. Put his arms around us in times of sorrow and distress and comfort us through his presence and power. He came, to bring, he came to bring to us ultimate healing. Now you've heard me say here that when we pray for healing, God always answers prayer. And I'll just remind you of what I said. God sometimes heals us through the natural processes of the body. He sometimes heals us with an antibiotic and a doctor. He sometimes heals us through surgery. He takes something out, puts something in, repairs something. He sometimes touches our life personally in a very personal way. I've been sick several times in my life, as you have. I always prayed for healing. I can only remember one time that God ever completely touched my life for healing. And if that happened, you'll never forget it. You know. But the ultimate healing, the ultimate healing most of us don't want to hear about. The ultimate healing is the resurrection where he promised that we will have a new life and a new body. A new body. Think of that. No high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no cancer, no poor eyesight. You can throw your glasses away. All those things that came will suddenly vanish and be gone in the new life. That's God the Holy Spirit's promise to us as he works in us to fulfill his will and his way as we serve him in the world today. Now, someone might say, well, how, uh, where is the sun? And someone might say, 93 million miles away. 
But no, the sun is not only 93 million miles away. The sun is right out there. Some might say, where's the Holy Spirit? He's somewhere in Syria today. He's in, <clears throat> in the Congo today. He's in China today. He's in Russia today. He's in the United States today. He's in Jerusalem today. He's in all these places everywhere today. Why? Because he came to us in the third person of the Trinity. There are no limitations upon God and where God works and where God is and how God does his job. It's just amazing to me. It confounds me when I stop to think about it, you know. Can't wrap my mind around it all. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and that God came in the form of the Holy Spirit. That 120 disciples gathered together in the upper room as they waited and prayed, suddenly there was a mighty wind, a mighty wind. And through that wind, men and women and children began to speak in new tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit gave them utterance. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And cloven tongues like fire rested upon their lips. And they all began to praise God with one voice. And the Holy Spirit said, Go, be my witnesses to all people. What a powerful thing. Powerful. Where did he come from? Don't know. Where is he? Here. Where is he going to be next? Don't know. But God has promised us that he'll be with us even to the end of the age. I tell you, folks, that may not be encouraging to you, but it's encouraging to me to know that there's not anything going to happen to me or to you that you're going to have to face alone. Because as we look to him through the eyes of faith, he draws near to each of us. And not only near, not only draws near to us, but he's in us, the hope of glory for his work in the world today. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All right, I think the hymn is 377.